we don't lose that connection. All right, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, this is the third in a series that we're calling Mission Possible, the Spectrum Repack webinar series. We're going to be starting shortly, uh, probably about 2.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, in the meantime, please hold as we wait for others to join in. And uh, we look forward to bringing you a really great webinar here in just a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah, 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 it's easily 500. Yeah, so, um, okay, hello everyone, and uh, welcome again to the Repack Roundtable. Thanks for joining us. This the final installment of our Mission Possible Spectrum Repack webinar series. In this one, we'll be discussing hot topics and concerns about the upcoming Repack in a group session, unlike what happened Tuesday and Wednesday. Ideally, you were there for those presentations. Um, they are actually on our webinars section on our website if you'd like to go back and check them out. It's there.com slash webinars. But uh, what we're going to have today are a group of people, experts who I think you'll be very glad to hear from. We're going to have um, Rich Redmond, who is the Gates Air Chief Product Officer. Martin Horspool, who is the Product Manager of our TV Transmission Department and Division. Joe Cecilia, who is the manager of market and product development for TV transmission, and Mark Voorhees, who is our director of sales for key accounts in the Americas, and our special guest calling in from Washington, D.C., is Ms. Pamela Gallant, who is the associate division chief of the video division for the FCC. Um, and my name is Keith Adams. I'm the marketing communications manager here. I'm no one important, but I'll be acting as a moderator for this webinar. As the title suggests, again, we'll be using a forum format. It's not so much about slide presentations this time around. Uh, it's more about talking about topics and answering questions. Speaking of questions, please direct your attention to the live chat pane on the webinar page, either below or to the right of the video you're currently watching. And after the topical discussion is over, we're going to be fielding questions from you, the audience. And you can enter them in using that instant message area in the live chat pane. So we've allotted an hour to this webinar, but if we don't get a chance to answer every question from the audience, we'll have contact info available for each of the roundtable participants, so you can follow up with them offline. So without further ado, let's get started with topic, with topic number one. Um, let's start with a discussion of the Spectrum Repacks impact outside of the television broadcast industry specifically as it relates to FM radio stations. It's, it's currently understood 
that the repack won't universally affect radio in the U.S. But the key factor does lie in whether or not an FM station shares a tower with TV stations that will be repacked. Um, is this accurate, Rich Redmond? I mean, who is likely impacted in the radio world? Yeah, great question, Keith. You know, as, as uh, everybody's been preparing and asking a lot of questions over the past year, uh, you know, if you're a TV station, this has been a hot topic. You go to some radio stations and, you know, they think repack is what you do before you go back to college. Uh, but, um, you know, look, if you've got shared infrastructure and there's about 1,300 uh, radio stations that have shared infrastructure with TV stations, and some of these are low power, they may be lower on the tower and nowhere near the television aperture, so it might not be a big deal. In other cases, you know, over time, television and radio antennas have become pretty closely packed at the top of the tower, so that either needing to install interim antennas or swapping out the main TV antenna on the tower is going to have significant interruption. So if you're an FM radio station that doesn't have a non-co-located backup, some you know, regional coverage backup at another location, then uh, this could be a challenge for you during the time that there's antenna work going on or structural work on the tower. The other challenge may very well be that a lot of these uh, transmitter sites that are multi-tenant, some have all separate rooms, but there are others where the rooms are commingled. And it could very well be, for example, that uh, several radio stations have been added and the place you'd like to be able to fit the new television transmitter or if you need to tune a transmitter, the areas that need to be worked on, uh, the radio infrastructure is kind of intermingled. And certainly when you talk about electrical, if I'm going to need to go make changes in my electrical panels and uh, distribution within a facility for a new TV transmitter, it may very well cause power interruptions, and if I'm a radio station that's co-located, I may have some impact. Yeah. So for most part, I've been getting a lot of questions. The, the clear guidance is, look, if you're an FM radio station, you're co-located, the first thing you ought to do is, is go have a discussion with your tower landlord or with your other tenants, the, the other broadcasters, uh, and engage them in a conversation about what the repack plans, you know, that they can share might be, and, um, and then you can start making plans if you need off-site backup or you may need to move some things around in the facility to help address um, uh, the repack plans. So it's really the first the first steps trying to go and engage and ask questions. We think there'll be a lot that even though they share the, the tower facilities uh, may not have a lot of impact, but there are definitely some where the FM antennas and the TV antennas are very closely spaced, so power work's going to be impacted. And some of these buildings are really tight. So, you know, it, it may be a case of needing to move some things around. And generally, an FM transmitter is way easier to move uh, than a large TV transmitter that's liquid cooled, for example. Gotcha. It's still a bunch of work, but uh, that's kind of the area to start. And that's definitely something that, that we're prepped for with service. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've had. Um, as part of some of the site survey work we've done, we looked at both uh, TV and radio stations, uh, and how uh, we might be able to um, how we might be able to uh, help them figure out what the issues are. Um, so, as far as um, as far as just kind of the time limit, the, the time on this, we're everyone is used to the thirty nine. Uh, month number, that magic number, how long this is all going to take for the TV station. Unless Pam tells us it's extended. Oh, okay. and, and, and which, I'm thinking, no, it's not April 1st, but I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, for sure, um, it's kind of a sooner is better kind of thing. Is this something that we're thinking is going to hit people throughout the full, um, you know, three Yeah, right. Months? I mean, I think it's going to depend on where you are. You know, part of your dialogue with your, your you know, co-site um, mates or co-tenants is finding out where they fall in the schedule, right? So there are the different uh, phases, uh, and so depending upon where the primary TV stations fall phase-wise, you know, the, the final testing and move will happen at a different time, but it could very well be that there's a lot of tower work, and so they need to get on that right away, even if they're not in phase one. It just depends if it's really, you know, a substantial amount of work. So I think each site's going to be a little bit different. 
um, you know, it's it's unlikely that you know if the trigger goes off in I'll pick a number three months from now or whatever it is, um, it's unlikely in the first sixty days all of a sudden there's going to be huge disruptions if you're a radio station um, because chances are people aren't swapping out antennas then. But absolutely, uh, the sooner you get on it, uh, the better. And uh, look, if you're an FM radio station, you're co-located, you need some help in planning, uh, then by all means, uh, we'll be glad to uh, help with site surveys or some planning. Awesome. Uh, let's uh, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, if I could, if I could add to that, I was, I was at a site yesterday, and there were some FMs, and they, they it's a candelabra, and they have uh, places where they can temporarily move them. Um, but I'm curious, since we have Pam on, is I don't think that any of that is in the Widelity catalog. Who's responsible for filing those costs with you all? And is it the radio station or the television station that has that responsibility? Um, yes. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, unfortunately, for FM stations and other co tenants of Free Pack stations, the Spectrum Act limits reimbursement only to paying the expenses of the repack broadcasters and MVPDs that also um, incur expenses to continue to carry those stations. Um, in a commission report and order that came out in 2014, the commission made one exception to this, and it's not even really an exception, it's a clarification. To the extent a tower uh, co-tenant incurs expenses, they're reimbursed a non repack station that is recurs and incurs expenses they'd be reimbursable only if the moving station is contractually obligated to the co-tenant for those expenses and that contract already existed prior to the time that 2014 order came out otherwise um, there isn't any uh, monetary recourse from the fund, from the TV uh, relocation fund for um, FM stations or other tenants. But so if there was the, uh, an obligation for the TV station, that the, they would incur the cost and, and they would have to reimburse the, the radio. Correct. Correct. If there is such a contract, then the repack station would um, submit to, uh, to the fund through the form 399 uh, repaying or, or compensating their co-tenants for those expenses, and um, they would they would send us some supporting documentation. For example, the contract or the language and the agreement that shows that they're responsible for that. And then the payment would be made to the repack television station, who would be responsible for um, for paying the radio station or other tenants. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pam. Thanks, and Pam. so now uh, let's move on to our next topic, um, which has been very popular with our previous webinars this week, and that would be transmitter retunability. A broadcaster earlier asked us about his UAX 2000, which is indeed fully retunable across the band, though it is important to note that you know the RF system might need to be replaced, other components like that. But um, I'll have Martin Horsepool field one of the more popular general questions that we receive, and uh, that would be, is my IoT transmitter retunable? Yes, thank you, Keith. Hello, everybody, again. Um, so that's a very, very good question. We've been asked it almost daily, I think, lately, because everyone's thinking about repack and what they do with the old equipment and so forth. So I'm going to split this up into two categories of IoTs. First of all, we have products dating back quite a few years now using what we call standard IOTs or single collector IOTs. And our model for that was called the Sigma, Sigma CD to be precise. Um, that model has long been discontinued. We do not manufacture a replacement for it. We've long, you know, long time ago stopped using standard collector IOTs. So it's basically an obsolete product. Obviously we have enough parts to support customers in the field that have them. However, going forward, you know, there is a time period after which we cannot support that product. And that time period's coming fairly close now. So that's a product that absolutely, in all cases, would need to be replaced. There are some, even though everybody knows the tube itself is inherently broadband, the tube itself, but it fits into a circuit that has tuning parts. It's cavities and sliding fingers and 
domes and coupling loops, all of those parts would have to be provided by the tube supplier. We know they're in limited supply. Um, they only have a few in stock, and I don't know what their capability of manufacturing enough to do wholesale frequency changes in any case. So adding all that up, uh, the complexity of trying to channel change one of these um, it's just not worth the effort. It would be very expensive if it could be done, and there's always a danger of breaking something and then running into a situation where the parts cannot be obtained or replaced, you end up with no transmitter at all. So, um, in all cases, with the standard collector, the Sigma series, uh, it's a replacement only situation. Uh, so, that's clear. The other product that I'd like to discuss is our energy saving collector IoT transmitter. It's a much newer design. Ours is called Power CD. Uh, we still fully support that. However, we have discontinued manufacture of that product um, a year or two ago. So again, it's another project that does have a finite uh, lifespan to it. Um, we are able to quote, in many cases, the frequency change on that product, but it does come with some, you know, some, some, some potential issues. Uh, let me go through what those could be. Um, aside from the RF components external to the transmitter, which obviously have to be replaced, uh, the tube itself, again, fits into a cavity assembly, a circuit assembly that has moving parts. Uh, some of those parts have not been moved since the transmitter was installed. So potentially, when you start moving something with sliding finger stock that has some corrosion, uh, dirt or dust embedded in it by now because of the airflow through the, through the product plus the environmental conditions, there's, an, there's a really quite high chance that there will be some problems occurring. Either those parts are frozen, they're seized, or if you do manage to move them successfully, arcing and sparking. And, you know, that could damage those parts, and therefore you need a new set of circuit assembly parts, which are fairly expensive. The other real problem here is that tube. You don't know how old some of these tubes are. They may be the original tubes, and, and they, they run quite reliably for a long, long time. Uh, however, <laughs> um, they do gradually, gradually degrade in performance. There's also issues with... Um, you know, material building up on the inside of some ceramic insulators that are essentially uh, separating some collectors at very high voltages between them. So there could be some deposits in there. What happens here is when you retune a tube and you, during the tuning process, even though you turn the power down, when you turn the power back up, if everything's not perfectly done, you can have higher voltage peaks, higher voltage surges or whatever. You know, you, you can have higher voltages between these um, electrical connections inside the tube that can cause an arc internally to the tube and that will destroy the tube instantly. So in all of any quotes that we've done, I understand Mark, you can correct me if we're wrong, but I think we've we've actually included new tubes in our quotes. So it becomes a very expensive frequency change procedure. Yeah, we, we feel that it, it because of the risk involved in retuning the tubes sort of being uh, in my mind a little black magic and they, they kind of when they settle in on a channel, they, they're happy there and if you try and move them, they might not be as happy when exactly. they wake up. Exactly. Um, and because of the duration of time it takes to get a tube now, like six months probably, that it would be irresponsible to attempt a channel change on a tube without having the tubes there to So there'd be some it. lead time issues with that, so you need right. to order that early if we you are going to attempt it. We wouldn't want to take somebody off the air for six months while we yeah. waited on a tube. <laughs> No. So that's that's really the issue there. So, you know, we, we would offer a channel change. Our service department can do all the work, but it does need to be done well in advance. We do need the tubes in there, potential circuit assembly and cavity loops and domes and other parts and pieces. Plus, there's an RF breakaway with a, with a low-pass filter. That might need to be changed. The circulator is still involved. There's other bits and pieces, too, as well as the obvious external parts. So it can be done. It's not highly recommended. Uh, the other issue that we were talking about just before this meeting is the fact that if you need to do a frequency change, it's quite time consuming. You don't want to do it well ahead of when you really have to change frequencies. And the problem is going to be coordinating that with adjacent stations in the same market or having to change. You don't want to retune it, go back to original channel and then retune it again. That's not really practical. That would triple the expense and triple the chances of having a, a problem. Any more comments on that point, Mark? I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that kind of limits the... Uh, um, you know, we're quoting them, and um, but logistically, the stations are going to have to figure out how that how that all works out. Um, you know, maybe they have a full power backup, and then in that case, that's a viable solution. So there are some stations that could do it, but it's not necessarily a good answer for everybody to try this. I right. think that's, that's our general. So IoT is kind of just to summarize earlier models. Anything with standard collectors, we're, we're not we're not even quoting replacements for those. So we are 
you know, we're calling solid state replacements. The energy saving collectors, the power CD versions, we will do it on a case by case basis. I think that's the summary and just contact us if you need more details. Awesome. It, so assuming people have newer gear and they're, they're in a solid state mind already, what other parts of the RF chain um, you were mentioning on mm -hmm. Tuesday that people want to think about, like you're saying, like their RF filters, low pass filter, whatever, what, right. what kind of culprits should they be paying attention to in the, in the pre-planning? Right. So that's a very good question, Keith. So um, we have more than one version of a low pass filter or often called a harmonic filter that, that falls into at least two bands in our products. So you've got to look at that and make sure you're in the right band that could have to be changed. We have matching sections in some cases with, you know, tuning sections, if you want to call them that, for matching out the internal line. Those would need to be adjusted. They don't necessarily have to be replaced. Uh, we have dummy loads or test loads. Those, again, are inherently broadband, but most of those have some kind of matching section in front of them. So that has to be swept and retuned. It's basically a service, service job. Now, obviously, the mask filter is an item that in most cases will have to be replaced. There are a few newer products out there that have tunable filters, but that can easily be looked at. We can help the customer determine if what he's got is tunable or not tunable very easily. In most cases, the high power filters that are out there are not tunable at all, not even one channel. So those have to be replaced. Uh, if you have a combiner of any sort, including Magic T or standard hybrid combining, lots of those, well, all the Magic Ts have to be replaced. Hybrids may have some broadbandness to them, but again, we'll have to look at the specifics to make sure the hybrid combiner would work or not work on a new channel. I would say in nearly all cases that has to be replaced as well. So pretty much everything inside the building, except for obvious pieces, things like elbows, coaxial elbows and things, straight sections of line, if they're of a length that's reusable, which is unlikely, could be reused. So in generally, in generally, we're quoting all new internal RF in every um, frequency change quote. Yeah, well, yeah. all the manufacturers in the last three to five years have, have been developing retunable filters, yeah. but it's safe to say if you put your RF system in prior to the analog sunset of 2009, maybe if, if on a low power there might be some tunable filters, yeah. but on a high power Very few. it's not retunable and it need to be replaced. Yeah, I'd say in almost all cases those those mask filters need to be replaced, in almost all cases. Okay. Well, definitely. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's uh, move on to topic three which is the post-auction transition timeline. So we know that March 30th is the final day of the long but ultimately successful FCC incentive auction. And now people are starting to ask, now what? You know, and, uh, but here's some popular concerns about the timing. Um, Pam Gallant, would you be able to speak a bit on some important upcoming milestones uh, that might be set? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so after the, that auction ends, uh, that March 30th date, the next big milestone will be the release of the, the closing and channel reassignment public notice. Um, you probably know that that is the official act that um, signifies the close of the auction and it um, kicks off the 90-day deadline for filing CPs and cost estimates and it also kicks off um, the transition period. So that that is that is a big big date, and you, that you should look for that sometime in April. Mm -hmm. um, if you've been following uh, FCC news, you know that a transition plan um, PN was released recently. Um, there will be construction deadlines will be given to stations within a phased transition schedule. Um, this phased approach was adopted to address issues of interference and in an attempt to facilitate um, the efficient use of resources. There will be 10 transition phases. So right now, um, stations know their new channel assignments and their transition phase, so which of those 10 um, phases they'll be, they'll be in, uh, and that's as a result of confidential letters that were mailed to each station that, um, that has to change channels. Um, once the channel reassignment public notice is released, they will also find out if they are a linked station. So if they are included in a phase um, with other stations uh, that, are, that have interference interdependencies. 
Uh, that public notice will also um, not only show who are the other link stations so that um, stations know who they need to coordinate it with, it will also uh, reveal the testing period for each phase and the start and end date of each phase, um, including the last date on which uh, a station can, op can operate on its pre-auction channel. Um, on the reimbursement side, um, we recently adopted the fi a final catalog of costs. So posted on our website now is a PDF showing the catalog with the um, price ranges that we are using um, at least for, for this year. So for, for purposes of estimates and for the first year of actuals, that will be the, um, the, rep, the, the item to reference. Um, probably many people have heard of Form 399, which is the reimbursement um, form. Many people might have, might have also actually had the opportunity to look at the online form. We held a, um, a beta test for interested parties a few months ago and got some very good feedback from users, which allowed us to make some improvements. You know, it's funny, form is this, that's topic number four. His, his oh, did board. I skip ahead? Um, oh, well, you know, please. honestly, feel feel free because I'm sure that that I'm sure no one's really interested in in relocation expense <laughs> reimbursement. <laughs> but yeah, definitely do it. This is this is your show. Okay, I'll just I'll just say a little bit more about what's coming up on the reimbursement front, and then I'll I'll turn it back to you. Um, so the online Form 399, which is the system that stations will use to file their estimates and also to submit their reimbursement requests throughout the reimbursement period, um, that's not currently available, but we're very close. It will be available um, online prior to release of the channel reassignment public notice. So watch for a, a public notice announcing its availability probably later this month. Okay. Um, on that note, I just also want to say that from the time the Form 399 system is open until the channel reassignment PN is released, stations will be able to log in and save their information so they can already start working on getting up all the information they need for their estimates but they won't be able to certify or submit that information until after the channel reassignment PM comes out sometime in April. After that point, they can go in, they can save, they can certify and submit their estimates at any time, um, as well as sort of all the background information that's required, contacts and things like that. But they will only be able to save actual reimbursement requests. So to the extent that a station has already incurred expenses and has the invoices and is eager to submit them, they can go ahead and save those after the channel reassignment public notice comes out, but they won't be able to actually certify and submit those requests for reimbursement until after we make an allocation for their station, which of course can't happen until we have all the estimates in at the 90-day deadline. Okay. Um, I had, a, I had a question actually uh, hopping back to something you said earlier um, and actually it was an observation that Mark Voorhees mentioned. Um, you were talking about how everyone has gotten assignments and they're aware at um, where they should be as far as in those uh, transition phases. Um, and he noticed that in, even in some cities, specific cities, that there were channels that had different you know, phases and in the same city. And yes. uh, is, yeah, yes. could you talk a little bit about that and, and why it's set up that way? Well, it's super complicated. Um, and if anybody, you know, if, if you, it, the PN actually, I think is very well written that explains um, how this came about. So if, if you have time, it, it is good reason, good reading. But if I could just, I'll just summarize um, briefly. The way that the transition scheduling was completed, um, there are actually two computer models that were used. Um, what's called the phase assignment tool, which was an optimization technique that assigned repack stations to one of the 10 phases. Um, that's already been run. Like we said, the stations already know which phase they're in. 
there were various constraints that um, were fed into the optimization. One of which was that um, there would be no more than two transition phases within a DMA. I know um, the optimization team considered keeping, um, you know, having all stations in a DMA change within the same phase. That just was not workable given all of the interference um, constraints and concerns. Um, after the, um, so the phase assignment tool has been run, and like we said, stations know um, which phase they're going to be in. They're currently working on the sort of second component, the phase scheduling tool. This looks at availability of resources, especially when resources are constrained like tower crews, and um, sort of simulates the time required for the stations in each phase to complete their transitions. That's ongoing now. Um, that is, that's why we don't know the specific deadlines for each phase yet. Um, that will be announced with the channel reassignment public notice. But yeah, there, there, there were a lot of factors to consider. Um, I know the team that worked on this, you know, looked at a lot of different options in terms of how to make this efficient and fair. Um, and again, you know, I refer you back to that public notice for, um, from, for some good reading on, on how they considered and what was ultimately adopted in terms of, of phasing the transition. Okay. That, it sounds like the intent and purpose for sure is to make sure not everybody is trying to get theirs, you know, right at this exact same time. It does seem like a nice way to interleave some of the tasks between different stations. Um, yeah, again, you know, I'll let people do that reading and, and offline definitely you'll be able to contact the people here and we'll also have resources that you can look at um, at FCC.gov. We'll show them to you um, on request. Um, and I guess the final question that people have asked really is um, what kind of flexibility um, does the FCC anticipate um, is built into the, the transition timeline. I mean, how hard a stop does the FCC anticipate with the with that 39 months or, or even in earlier milestones? Right. Well, yes, I guess we should talk about, you know, earlier milestones since there will be, uh, you know, many, many stations that have deadlines um, well in advance of the 39 months. Mm -hmm. um, bottom line is that any proposal or any request for flexibility or any waiver request has to show that it's not going to disrupt the transition. Um, and, and there, I think the PN makes it very clear that sort of creative alternatives or suggestions are welcome. Um, the, any request to change a station's transition phase, either to move up to an earlier phase or push back to a later phase, will be reviewed for the impact on the overall transition schedule. Um, to the extent that the station can show that um, its request does not impact the transition, it's likely to be granted. Um, there are other uh, sort of flexible, flexibility um, also outlined in that public notice. There's um, a, what we're calling temporary joint use of channels temporary channel assignments, things like that, that um, a station might require um, if it finds it's not likely to meet the deadline. Um, you, in that case, you would seek authority via an STA. And again, you would have to show compliance with technical rules like you always do. And of course, that it's not interfering with another station's transition. Okay. Um, I think, we're going to move this along. I, you were able to talk a bit about Form 399, and I know that there's actually a, a bunch of questions that are coming in that we're going to deploy here at the Q&A session at the end of these topics. But we'll go actually to the final topic, which I think is also very interesting to everybody here. Um, this will be more for Joe Cecilia. Um, let's discuss ATSC 3.0, the uh, next gen standard that everybody's talking about is becoming extremely popular in the over the air uh, industry here. And many say the timing just couldn't be better. 
So, Joe, when it comes to updating broadcast gear for ATSC 3.0 capability, why should people time it up with repack updates? Well, thanks, Keith. Um, I think the, the common school there is, is that while, while all this work needs to be underway in the first place, uh, go ahead and, and plan to be future-proof um, and, and you know, put uh, some extra investment in, in your antenna system or other parts uh, that you're touching anyway. So, you know, ATSC 3's physical layer was designed not only to deliver, you know, rooftop television as we know it, but to be flexible and offer modes that reach, you know, mobile, portable, handheld devices of, we like to say the future, but I think it's the present. Um, you know, look at everybody and their mobile devices. So, um, you know, broadcasting has an excellent chance to catch up with, with uh, ATSC 3.0. So, um, by addressing your antenna and planning for 3.0 as part of the repack, you know, you can look at increasing your signal density um, and, and, you know, add perhaps vertical polarization. Uh, there was a, a study done uh, three, five years ago maybe by an uh, antenna manufacturer when uh, ATSC mobile handheld, the current, the, the mobile handheld capability that's added to the current ATSC standard in terms of what component of vertical polarization do I need to really be effective? And the outcome of that study was that it was a, a, on the order of one third um, was almost ideal. So a vertical polarization, I mean a, an elliptical polarization versus a, a complete circular. Um, however, I think we understand that the uh, station is not going to be reimbursed for that. But if you can get a baseline cost for your replacement antenna, and then get the delta in cost to add the vertical polarization and the station foot the bill for that vertical polarization adder um, could be in the end less cost than if you were to do it all over. So while you're in this construction and rebuild phase, future proof it. Uh, on, on, but again, it's, it's going to be at station's expense. Um, but could represent you know, a substantial long-term savings in the, in, in the actual outlay. Um, the other thing to consider uh, has been quite popular is SFNs uh, with ATSC 3.0. And 3.0 is OFDM based. It, it lends itself naturally to an SFN architecture. Um, and there's been uh, a lot of proposals out there about putting uh, transmitters at the edge and pointing inward and so forth. There, there's, a, there's a lot of different architectures that, that one could put on for, uh, to get an SFN architecture. Um, and it can be uh, done with, with gap fillers as well as dedicated SFN transmitters. Um, and by looking at an SFN architecture, you know, what you're doing is, is you're, you're putting a, a more uniform signal. It may be a little bit lower power, but it's more uniform to better serve mobile and indoor devices. And that's the key thing. Think of cellular towers. There's a lot of them, and they're lower, and they're lower power but the, the signal is, 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 is uniform where it is, or much more uniform, excuse me. And, uh, you know, the, the FCC allows SFNs through its distributed uh, transmission rules back in 2008. Um, it's FCC uh, 08256A1. Um, there's rules there to, to put on SFN networks, and, and there's, there's key things. There will also be a paper, I think, given at the NAB about this, um, in that, you know, you can't expand your coverage. You can't put in uh, an SFN to cherry pick a new uh, a new part of the neighborhood that is not served by your old tower. Um, but you know, it's something I think that really should be considered as, as part of the the rollout. So, it's like you say, the timing couldn't be better. It's like while there is a lot of disruption, while you're doing all this work, uh, make yourself future proof. And the the fact that the commission has recently uh, you know, ruled that the ATSC 3.0 is going to be allowed on a voluntary basis, I think opens that up. Mm -hmm. And Pamela, would, would you be able to, uh, to kind of elaborate? And, and certainly when it comes to what stations should plan uh, for as it relates to reimbursement or potential license updates um, where these kinds of upgrades are, are, are kind of co-installed, what, is, what does the FCC think about, about the timing of this? Yes, well, um, as you know, there are some experimental licenses that have been granted to um, to test the the um, to test this this new um, 
standard. Um, and there was an, a notice of proposed rulemaking put out on 3.0. So adoption of the standard as broadcasting, which has been requested of the FCC, is is on its own um, forward track. And, um, you know, I have no estimates in terms of timing, but um, I, I think it's fair to say that it that it is underway and, and well on the way. Um, in terms of coordinating with the repack, um, you know, I've heard many stations interested in this, and it does seem like uh, an extremely, uh, you know, happy coincidence that uh, so many stations will have to replace so much equipment at this point, and um, we'll be able to look to this new standard and to, um, you know, their uh, their goals for the future, um, and you know, purchase the equipment that they that they need to to meet those goals. I think the nice thing about the um, the reimbursement uh, regime that the commission put in place for repack stations is that, um, you know, we, we are not going to be judging what a station can purchase and what they can't purchase. Um, you know, I'm sure it seems like there's a lot of sort of pent up demand for new equipment. People have been anticipating this auction for several years. There was the freeze even before that. Um, so it's not surprising that many stations are looking to purchase new equipment and, and want to make it as state of the art as possible. Um, it's true that not everything would be reimbursable. Um, things like uh, e-poll, things like increased power for purposes of 3.0 um, would be considered upgrades in most instances. Um, but again, it does seem to make sense. And from what we're hearing, a lot of stations are looking at this very closely to make sure that they're taking advantage of um, the efficiencies and having to replace their equipment and, and um, complete construction just the one time. That's, that's good to know. That, that is, probably makes people feel a little better, <laughs> sure. Um, so I, th I think at this point, we're going to uh, jump ahead to questions and answers from the crowd. And thanks, everybody, for their participation uh, with the topics. The, in the insight and information is awesome. Um, but let's uh, look at some of these questions that have been coming through over live chat. There's been more than a few. Uh, for fairness, uh, there's a few that actually came in a little bit earlier. And I'd like to, uh, to kind of uh, talk to someone who actually just put the question up again. Um, and it's a guy named Spencer the Boss who asked this question on, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So, um, but he's, he's wondering if, if particularly you, Pamela, if, if you could talk about the, uh, the flex use in exchange for relocation expenses provision um, as, it re as it relates to reimbursement. He points out that it, it's uh, pretty important and he hasn't heard that much about it. What, what is what are your opinions about flex use and how broadcasters, you know, could benefit from it? Sure, um, that's, uh, in, in, if you're looking for more information um, besides what I have to talk about today, um, we would typically refer to this as the service rule waiver. Um, so what this would be, what, what the commission has set out is a process for a repack station to, um, to seek a waiver um, in order to have flexible use of its spectrum. Um, one requirement is that uh, it has to uh, always provide one broadcast television stream at no charge to the public. But um, broadcasters that have creative ways um, and proposals for using uh, their spectrum in conjunction with while still meeting that requirement can um, can make a proposal to do so. Um, th those waiver requests have to be filed within 30 days of the channel reassignment public notice. Um, they are going to be considered um, on a sort of case specific basis. Um, again, we need to see the specifics of what the uh, what the station is planning. Then um, the station will be told whether its waiver request is granted. If so, it will have 10 days following uh, notification that it was granted to accept the terms of the waiver. 
Um, then if the station decides to go ahead, if it's granted and they accept, the, um, the station would gain the flexibility that it's requesting. However, it would forego um, reimbursement for its repact uh, for any expenses it would incur as a result of the repack. Okay. <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully, excuse me, hopefully that's very much the answer you were looking for, Spencer. Um, there's, um, there's actually one more that came in um, earlier that was a, from an anonymous source, but um, there was a scenario also for FCC to ponder. Consider a station that would be in phase five and they move to a new physical location before phase five starts. They buy a transmitter today and tune it to their current frequency. When phase four hits, they retune it to the new frequency and swap or retune the mask filter. Is all or any of this reimbursable? That sounds um, like it may be a fairly common scenario, um, and, it, and it, it does sound like uh, a plausible transition plan, um, which would make the uh, you know the the equipment reimbursable. Um, I would just I'm not sure about the move to a new physical location part. Um, you know they would need to have their CT approved, of course, before um, you know before that could happen. But in general, um, I think this seems like a fairly uh, common scenario, and um, you know I don't see anything that raises a red flag that it would not be reimbursed. Okay. Um, well, on to the questions that are in the live chat proper. Um, asked, I will be interested in hearing about the testing period. How can this be done if a station has a single transmitter that's being retuned and antenna and mask filter that are being replaced? And if, testing, if the testing period requires a second transmitter, how do we encode PSIP in different TSIDs? Um, who wants to feel that? <laughs> well, on, on, uh, on, I guess maybe uh, Pam could field on the, the testing period part, uh, but let me uh, try and address the you know, PSIP and TSID. Um, I, I would, not the expert there, but I would hope that that's a, a simple case of changing um, what you need to in the, in the PSIP generator, right? But there, I would think there's gotta be some public service announcement or something on that order to alert the market to rescan to get it right. Um, yes, when I, I may be missing some of the nuances, but when I heard that question, I thought that um, lying within the question was a, was the issue of whether interim equipment is that's required um, is reimbursable, and the answer is yes. Um, in order to stay on the air um, and comply with the testing period, um, to the extent that interim uh, transmission equipment or an antenna or both are required, those would be reimbursable. And um, here's a very interesting question. Um, also from Ted, if uh, if I need to replace a tower that also contains an FM station, uh, you know, who pays for the cost of the FM relocation? Yep, that that goes back to what is what is the contractual relationship? Is it is there a tower owner with which um, the tenants have uh, a lease agreement? And you know, what does that lease agreement say? You know, who's rebuilding the tower? Um, is the tower owned by the station? And if so, is there a contract that um, that governs the the FM station's use of that tower? Um, we have to look at all of those different scenarios. But in general, unless there is a contractual obligation for the repack station to um, pay for any costs incurred by uh, uh, an FM station or another tower tenant, um, those entities cannot be reimbursed from the fund. Okay, um, Eric Bergman asks um, about the beta test, you know, Form 399 site. Um, 
He was wondering if it's been updated with the new fidelity cost estimates. That's what we're in the process of doing, mm -hmm. right? That we're pushing all that into production, doing final IV and V on the system, um, you know, making sure that it's ready to be in production and, um, you know, be put out there for the public, all of the sort of behind the scenes work that needs to be done to get a new system up. But but the short answer is yes, we, we pro we're providing um, or we're including rather the updated fidelity cost um, in the in the cost catalog that was released recently. Um, uh, yeah, PSO asks how much optimization um, and channel changes from what we were assigned do you expect? And I, I suspect that's a question also for Pam. Uh, well, I mean, channel ch channel optimization has already occurred, right? The, the repack itself was optimized. And um, the goal, the first consideration was to uh, have as high a number as possible of channel stays. So that has already occurred. Um, is there another, I'm not sure if there's another context in which this question is being asked. Um, we may scroll down a little farther. Yeah, I, I don't know, Pam, if that's related to antenna patterns or, you know, other coverage optimization from a specific site on a specific channel versus what might be originally planned. I know we've had some customers ask about that, that Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. So, so are we talking about a um, particular station's, um, you know, uh, desire to sort of maximize on their new station or uh, expand their facilities? Could be. Yeah, uh, okay, let's, know, let's say that because I yeah, 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 could be, but it I also it also could be that perhaps the 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 attendee's question is with respect to it's like you said it's all been optimized and and assigned now. But it may be a, a what if, if the consult their consultant uh, comes with a different answer or the reality is different than was planned, you know what can be done there? Okay, well that's a that's a great that's a great tee up for me because I have not yet talked about the um, the post uh, channel reassignment PN windows that will be opening. Um, there are there are opportunities to um, expand facilities. Um, there's going to be a an initial priority window if for any station that for whatever reason um, can demonstrate that it cannot construct its um, you know on its post auction uh, channel assignment um, those the timing of these windows will will be uh, announced in the uh, channel reassignment public notice but that first priority is for um, stations that, that feel that they cannot construct, that they're having some serious problem. Uh, later, a second window will open um, that is um, that is for, um, sorry, that is for stations that wish to expand their facilities or maximize coverage. And that's when you could come in and you could show that your um, antenna pattern, you know, uh, could be used for, for some sort of expansion. And um, from what I understand, that's a fairly um, common procedure and that it would be the, the, um, the, the request would be granted if, um, you know, if it's consistent with the, with the um, interference uh, rules. Um, here's a, another question for you, Pam. Um, when will we know when our plan is accepted by the FCC and is a reimbursable plan and, and who specifically is making that decision? We are going to look at all the estimates that come in. Remember, those will all be coming in within the 90-day um, uh, period following release of the channel reassignment public notice. Um, we will have our newly hired fund administrator. Um, we've contracted with Ernst & Young to serve as, as that role. And they will be doing um, the first line review of all of the submissions, so estimates and actual requests for payment that come in later. Um, 
we will, you know, there will be a dialogue. They will be reaching back to the station with questions. Um, a station may be asked to provide some sort of supporting documentation, especially in a situation where um, they are, you know, they're seeking a piece of equipment that's not reflected in the cost catalog or they've got some other sort of special circumstances. I mean, certainly all of the complex um, sites will probably require some explanation um, in terms of uh, the fund administrator understanding the, um, you know, the station's plan and taking a good look at its estimates. Um, at that point, we will be making an allocation based on the amount of the fund that we have available to, um, to, to allocate for each station. And um, that will serve as sort of an initial budget to get the station started. So the station will, there'll be an amount reserved for each station's project. And they'll know that they'll be able to sort of draw down against that amount um, and as they start their construction. Okay, um, as it relates to some of the uh, the 3.0 stuff that Joe was talking about, someone asked if a station wants to spend extra money for upgrades to vertical polarization um, on an antenna, how will the FCC 399 break that reimbursement down to required replace and upgrade costs, as in the extra power needed on a transmitter? Right, so when a station is... Um, submitting its 399 it will indicate there will be a checkbox to indicate that it's seeking an upgrade and then it'll just be a matter of providing the documentation that shows that cost um, for example for the um, for the the, the polarization um, oftentimes that will just be a line item on an invoice so it's simply that line item amount for um, e poll for example, that would be, um, you know, not reimbursable and the cost of the upgrade. Um, other times, you know, for example, maybe with uh, a transmitter at a certain power level, you know, we'd have to see the cost of a comparable. And that's, that's also um, where the cost catalog can come into play. Um, we, we can use those costs to to show like for example what a certain power level transmitter would cost compared with um, the amount of the uh, the cost for the upgraded higher power transmitter so it's really just documentation which in in many cases um, should not be difficult yeah and certainly to, to Pam's point on that and I know Mark can can validate is we've had customers who've asked uh, you know, we've been able to provide pricing very much along those lines that, that Pam noticed, noted, so they can separate, you know, uh, the amount of equipment or, or product associated with a vertical component, which would be non-reimbursable versus uh, you know, OPR. So, you know, if you're a station that needs that requirement, uh, we're certainly able to help you. I'd, I'd love to tell you no one else's transmitter can do vertical component, but um, I'm, <laughs> I'm marketing. I will tell you. Yeah, that. factually, <laughs> you, when you're asking for the, you know, working on your quotes, simply working with uh, the salesperson or, or proposal person helping you with that, they can get you the type of documentation needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. we've been working with um, with different manufacturers, and um, you know, once. Once they understand how, you know, work and what we're looking for, they've been very willing to work with us. So I don't have any, I don't have, I'm not afraid at all that, you know, we'll have difficulty with the documentation. And, um, you know, certainly the manufacturers that we've talked to have been very helpful in this regard. Awesome. Yeah, um, so we provide a quote for like a V-Pole upgrade that, and, um, the, the plan would be to be to treat it as a separate order, so the invoicing for that would not get confused with the invoicing that they would submit for reimbursement. That will work fine. Um, I know other um, manufacturers are sort of just treating it as an upgrade line item on the same invoice. Um, I think either way is, is workable. 
Well, right now um, it is 302. I, uh, we have a lot of questions on the list, but uh, to be fair, we, we should probably only leave a little bit for probably just two more questions. Um, but definitely, if you want to reach anybody here offline, uh, stick around. We're going to give uh, contact information. Um, we have a question on a tower where two stations, one in repack, the other not. Um, should the tower loading issues cause both antennas to have to be replaced? Um, is the station reimbursed for the non-repack station? Um, and there's actually a second part to that question too. Um, also to make the loading work for the G standard, a smaller gain antenna, would that have to be used? And can we be reimbursed for a more expensive transmitter or more TPO? Okay, well, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. in that, those few sentences, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, you know, give an opinion on whether in a particular situation, um, certain equipment is reimbursable, but I will go back and reiterate that um, a non-repacked station, television station, an FM station, another tenant that's affected by the, um, by the repack is generally um, not eligible to be reimbursed from the from the TV broadcaster fund. Um, again, the exception is if the repack station has a contractual obligation to um, to pay for those types of expenses. So Pam, um, just out of curiosity, and, and, and I don't know if that's this particular um, you know person's question, but uh, it, you'd mentioned earlier about you would pay for upgrades for certain things if it was actually less expensive than making other changes. So for example, if simply changing the antenna for the repack station that moves, but there's structural reinforcement that needs to be done to a tower uh, to accommodate that, if it actually was less expensive to replace uh, that antenna and the other antenna on the tower and avoid the, the tower uh, structural work, is that something that's potentially uh, reimbursable? Yes, we would have to look at this on a case by case basis. But yes, we you know we're open to um, to creative ways to save time and money like that as long as they can be documented um, and as long as um, you know they don't they don't sort of violate any of the uh, parameters we put around the reimbursement right. program. But certainly, we would welcome um, a discussion from uh, the, you know, in those types of situations. And um, you know, like I said, when I was talking about the review that would be done um, of the submissions that come in, some will be, you know, fairly straightforward, and other times we'll have to go back to the station. We'll have to, you know, maybe review its engineering plans, maybe have discussions. And this certainly sounds like one of those um, those complex situations where we would need that back and forth. But as you say, in the end, if, it, if we could find a more efficient and less expensive, um, you know, alternative to just sort of ticking the boxes, we would certainly be open to that. Thanks. All right. Um, and uh, it's 306 right now. Definitely appreciate everyone's time and involvement. Um, I, I don't want to keep Pam Gallant here too much longer. Um, if, <coughs> if people have questions for you offline, <coughs> how would they be able to contact you? Pam, actually, everyone, but first, uh, Pam Gallant, how would uh, you like to be contacted if you have questions? Sure, I, um, I'm, I'm happy to take emails. That's usually the best way to, um, to reach me. And my email address is pamela.gallant, that's G-A-L-L-A-N-T, at FCC.gov, G-O-V. All right. Um, how about you, Rich Redmond? Uh, it's pretty easy, just rich at gatesair.com, and I'll be glad to field any questions. Joe Cecilia. It's J S E C C I A, J Cecilia, gatesair.com. <coughs> Martin Horsepool. It is Martin, M A R T Y N dot Horsepool, H O R S P O O L <coughs> at gatesair.com. 
And last but not least, Mark Voorhees. That would be <clears throat> M-A-R-K dot V-O-O-R-H-E-E-S at GatesAir.com. Um, and if for some reason you'd like to contact marketing, in fact, we would appreciate uh, any kind of feedback and info you've got on topics you'd like us to discuss in the future in webinars and or podcasting. Um, feel free to email marketing at gatesair.com or Keith Adams, K-E-I-T-H dot A-D-A-M-S at gatesair.com as well. Um, and the, the the URL on the screen right now should also get you in touch with all of the webinars that we've done this week and in weeks prior. A lot of great information in our video library. You can also visit our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash user slash Gates Air. Again, thanks everybody for participating. Um, thanks all of you in the audience for listening. And uh, we, we really hope that you got some great things out of this as we appreciated sharing our information with you. Um, thanks again to Pam Gallant for taking the time out. And uh, yeah, we definitely look forward to letting you know about the next webinars that we've got. In the meantime, have a great day. And from Gates Air, uh, we thank you again for the Mission Possible Spectrum Repack webinar series success. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.